Let us read this morning from, <clears throat> from the word that God has given us. New King James Version. Joshua five thirteen, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? You may be seated. Once again, we say welcome to everybody, especially to our guests. You may have noticed there is a attendance card inside the packet that was handed to you. If you would, pass that attendance card inside aisle, and they'll be picked up by these young men at that time. We are doing a study alternating it with a study of the book of Revelation. On the book of Joshua, now why Joshua? Because the book of Joshua is the theme book for next year's Lads to Leaders. So we're doing a study, and this study on Joshua will end uh, approximately the time that uh, Lads to Leaders, uh, the convention, is held. Now, next month, I'll be doing Joshua chapter 6, uh, Billy's going to join me on Joshua chapter 7 and chapter 8, and that will happen in the month of October. Now, in preparation for tonight, please read my article in the bulletin. We're going to be tackling Revelation chapter 8, and Revelation chapter 8 is one of the four most difficult chapters in the book of Revelation. So please read that bulletin article inside the bulletin and read, if you don't mind, read Revelation chapter 8. But now Joshua chapter 5. And when I look at Joshua chapter 5, I call it, Be Prepared. Be prepared for battle. You know, preparation, preparation is something we often have to do. When I think of preparation, I think about the times on December the 24th at night after the kids were in bed that I'd be up doing what? You know, putting together their toys for the next day, for the presents. And often there would be instructions that would come with the toy on how to build it. You know, it might be a, maybe a, a, some kind of a racetrack or something or, or maybe a doll. And I'd have to put things together. I'd have to follow the instructions. Instructions often come with different things. You buy maybe a, a software package and it comes with instructions on how to load it into your laptop and how to use it. We understand instructions. Usually instructions are very helpful because they accomplish what they're meant to accomplish. You, you finish the project, you build it, you put it together, it does its purpose. But sometimes instructions fail. About 40 or 50 years ago, the Peace Corps would often give their volunteers instructions on how to handle certain situations. And one uh, group they uh, tried to help was the volunteers that were serving in South America. And they said, here's what you do if this little guy ends up crawling into your tent. What is that? Oh, that's an anaconda, okay? That's a, that's a big snake. Anacondas can reach a maximum of 33 feet long. That's 33 feet long. They can weigh up to 550 pounds. That is one big snake. Here's what those instructions that were given to their volunteers, here's what it said. What do you do if this crawls into, slides into your tent at night. If you wake up and an anaconda is wrapping itself around your body, step number one, don't panic. Easier said than done, okay? If that anaconda was wrapping itself around me, I, I'm going to panic, I'm going to scream like a girl, 
you know, I'm going to go berserk. But they said, step one, don't panic. Step two, do not move. They said, if you move, the anaconda is just going to tighten its grip on you. So don't move. Step number three, slowly and quietly grab your knife and cut off the head of the snake. Oh, by the way, step, uh, the next step, uh, be prepared, have a knife close by, okay? <laughs> wow, yeah, have a knife close by. Now, here in Hot Springs, uh, we're not going to have to worry about that. You probably don't ever have to worry about an anaconda attacking you. But there is another snake that seeks to devour you every day. You know who he is. That's that old serpent, the devil who wants to take you down every chance he gets. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We have a battle that we have to fight. We're engaged in a spiritual battle. So how do we prepare for that battle? How do you get ready for that battle? How do you get ready to fight the devil? Chapter 5, verse 1. So it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea when they heard when they heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their hearts just melted. They, their hearts just melted. They're ready to give up. And there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. What's going on here? See, God, God's mighty hand and drying up the Jordan River had demoralized the enemy. I mean, they are lower than a snake's belly in a wagon rut. That's how low they are. And they're ready to give up. So what happens? Well, this is what we call shock and awe. We talked about that last week. It's creating the best time to attack. So verse 2 says, At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Go forth and conquer. Billy, is that what it says in your Bible? It says, doesn't say that, does it? No. It doesn't say that at all. It doesn't say go forth and conquer. You're not ready to go forth and conquer. Verse number 2. At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives for yourself. And circumcised the sons of Israel again, again, the second time. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the heel of the foreskins. Instead of attacking, instead of attacking when victory was assured, you know, they're demoralized, they're, they're, they're given up. God instructs all the men to go through this act. That's going to take several days to heal. And it will incapacitate Israel's entire army. In Genesis chapter 34, we have the story of Jacob's sons. And when they wanted to get revenge after Shechem took advantage of their sister, what did they do? They tricked him and his men into going through this very act. And then three days later, Two sons of Jacob wipes out Shechem and all his men. You see, Israel is going to be vulnerable too. Joshua's army is making themselves very vulnerable to the same kind of fate. Why? Look at verses 4 through 7. And it tells you, they had forgotten their covenant they had forgotten their covenant with God. Joshua had his soldiers to go through this act because they had not been when they were eight days old as required in God's covenant to Abraham. 
Genesis chapter 17. So an entire generation of male Israelites had missed it. Those born in Egypt had been, but their sons born in the wilderness were not. Now this act was very important to the Israelites. Why? Because it was the sign that God gave them that he would what? Keep his promise to give them many descendants and he would give them the land before them. This act was God's mark, God's proof that he would do what he said and he would give them the land. That's why Joshua's soldiers received that mark on that day. They went through this procedure so they could move forward with confidence in what? In God's promises. Let's look at verse 9. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Remember what Egypt had told them? You'll just die out in that wilderness. You'll just go out there and you'll die. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. This is important. God rolled away Egypt's scorn. Egypt had taught them that they would all perish in the wilderness, Exodus chapter 32. And by the way, they almost did that, you know, because of their, not because of their, that was because of their lack of faith. Because of their lack of faith in God and God's promises, they did die. Well, a generation died. After about 40 years previous, their fathers had refused to go into the land because they were afraid. They were afraid of the giants in the land and, and its wall cities. They forgot they had God on their side. They didn't believe God's promises. So God made them wander for about 40 years in the wilderness until that whole generation, except Joshua and Caleb, died off. However, however, God, he, he preserved the next generation. He preserved the next generation to go into the land that he promised to give them. And when they entered that land, God rolled away their shame. God rolled away the taunts of the Egyptians as pictured in this act of circumcision. Rolling away their shame was absolutely necessary in their preparation for battle. And it is absolutely necessary for you as well as you prepare to battle the unseen forces of evil today. If you're going to be ready to fight your spiritual battle, you must let God roll away your shame. Roll away your shame. Be prepared for battle. Allow the Lord, allow the Lord to take away your reproach. Permit Him to peel off the disgrace of your sin and unbelief. A few years ago, ESPN did a documentary. They called it The Four Falls of Buffalo. Buffalo, the Buffalo Bills had lost four consecutive Super Bowls, 90, 91, 92, and 93. The loss in that first one, 1990, was extremely bitter because they should have won the game. With only eight seconds to go in the game, all their field goal kicker, Scott Norwood, had to do was kick a field goal. Just kick a simple field goal and you win the game. He missed. The city of Buffalo decided to, uh, to host a, a victory parade for their team for at least making it to the Super Bowl. And Scott didn't want to go. He, he didn't want to go. His teammates talked him into going. He said, okay, I'll go, but I'm going to stay in the back. I'm going to stay in the back, and, and I'll hide behind you guys because I don't want to face the crowd. So they arrive there, and they're all on the podium, and the different team members are talking, and the crowd notices that they can't see Scott. So the crowd starts shouting, We want Scott! We want Scott! We want Scott! 
And finally, Scott, from the very back of the crowd of players, he walks up to the front, and when he does, and when the crowd sees him, they break out in thunderous applause. That calls Scott Norwood to say this. I know that I have never felt more love than I do right now. Expecting condemnation, Norwood found a small taste of what amazing grace. Friends, you too can experience that same grace and forgiveness from the one that counts, God himself. No matter what your failings are, all you need to do is trust and obey Jesus. God wants the rebellion cut from your heart. And that's exactly what Jesus does for us when we trust and obey him with our lives. He cuts away the rebellion, the inward pressure to sin. What if you received this recall notice in the mail? Now, this is fictional, but what if you received this in the mail? The maker of all human beings is recalling all units manufactured, regardless of make or year, due to the serious defect in the primary and central component, the heart. This is due to a malfunction. It's a malfunction in the original prototype units, resulting in the reproduction of the same defect in all units. This defect has been technically termed subsequential internal non-morality, S-I-N, or more commonly known as sin. Its primary symptom is a lapse of moral judgment. If one is susceptible to a loss of direction, you don't know how to direct your life. If you are susceptible to foul vocal emissions, saying words you shouldn't say. Do you have a lack of peace, a lack of joy? Uh, Do you have selfish behavior? Then then your unit is inflicted, inflicted with this defect. The manufacturer, who is neither liable nor at fault for these defects, is providing factory authorized repair and service, free of charge, to correct this sin defect just by obeying his word. Through faith in Christ, let God roll away your shame. It's the only way that you'll be prepared for the spiritual battles ahead. Then, to be prepared for those battles, even more, relish. Relish your salvation. Enjoy the benefits of God's grace and provision. Taste the goodness of God in your own life. That's what the children of Israel did after God rolled away their shame in the promised land. Verse 10. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover. Notice, they kept the Passover. They're now keeping the Passover. On the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. And they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Remember that manna that they had all those years? Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. This is the first month on their calendar. And now there's a change. No more manna. They are now living off of the land. They remembered their deliverance from Egypt and they relished the fruit of the land. God had provided manna for about 40 years, but now it's not needed. Now he provides the rich produce of his promised land. And the children of Israel, they are enjoying it. They're enjoying it. And they're relishing the benefits of God's grace and provision on the eve of their very first battle. And that's what you must do if you're going to be ready for the spiritual battles that you'll face in your life. Taste and enjoy the goodness of God. Know how good He actually is. 
You need to experience and relish your Heavenly Father's generosity to be able to face your battles. You know, I find it very interesting that at the end of Ephesians, at the end of the book of Ephesians, Paul talks about spiritual warfare. But at the beginning of Ephesians, at the beginning of the book of Ephesians, Paul identifies our what? Spiritual blessings. In other words, before God tells you through Paul to stand against the schemes of the devil, Ephesians 6, he reminds you that he has blessed you in Jesus with what? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 1. You see, you cannot fight the devil until you appreciate God's goodness and generosity. So stop. Stop every once in a while and reflect on how richly God has blessed you. Remember the song, Count Your Many Blessings? Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings and see what God has done. Enjoy those blessings and thank Him. Thank Him for what He's done for you. Amen. If you're going to be ready for the spiritual battles ahead, First, let God roll away your shame. Second, relish your salvation. And third, respect your sovereign Lord. Submit to Jesus, your King. Bow before the commander of the Lord's army. That's what Joshua does before he leads the children of Israel into battle against the city of Jericho. Verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and he looked and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are, are, are you for us or for our adversaries? What's happening here? Joshua is scouting out the battlefield when he meets a, a stranger, a strange man with a drawn sword. So Joshua asks the man, well, whose side are you on? Are you on our side or, or their side? Notice the reply, verse 14. So he said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. In other words... Joshua, Joshua, you're asking the wrong question. It's not a question whether or not I am on your side. The question is, are you on my side? It's not a question of whether or not I will submit to you. The question is, will you submit to me? Well, how does Joshua reply? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped. Circle that word, worshipped. And said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Joshua, the commander of the Lord's army, submits to the commander of the, uh, Israel's army, submits to the commander of the Lord's army. Verse 15. Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot. Well, that reminds me of something, doesn't it? Does that remind you of what the burning bush, you know, Moses? And God spoke to Moses from that burning bush and said, Take off your sandals. Take off your sandals off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Like Moses previously, Joshua removes his sandals in respect and surrenders his will to God and worships. Who is this man? Answer, we don't know for sure. Let me give you my opinion. And my opinion in $2 will buy you coffee in most places. I believe this is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus himself. Joshua worshipped him. He says essentially the same thing that God said to Moses. 
God the Father said it to Moses here, I believe, in my opinion, God the Son is saying it to Joshua. And Joshua worships. He respects his sovereign Lord. Now, today you may be battling cancer or some other illness. Or, or perhaps you're dealing with problems in your family. Perhaps your marriage is not where it needs to be. Perhaps you are facing problems at work. Whatever the battle you have, you must first engage in spiritual surrender. If you're going to be ready to face that battle, you must willfully obey the commander of the Lord's army and surrender to His will. If you're going to be ready to face the spiritual battles ahead, you must first let God roll away your shame. Two, relish your salvation. And three, respect your sovereign Lord. Then stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Make a stand for Him. Amen. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. You soldiers of the cross, lift high His royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, His army shall He lead till every foe is vanquished. And Christ, Christ is Lord indeed. This morning, are you a Christian? Remember the simple steps? You see that every time, every time I speak. Believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. You can't make it even any more simpler than that. As a Christian, do you need to seek forgiveness? God will forgive. 1 John 1, 9. The church stands ready to pray with you and for you. James 5, 16. Billy has selected a song to hopefully motivate you to make that decision. Will you please come as we stand and sing for your encouragement?